Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It has been a busy, full and cold week. Yeah. We had some friends in town for a few days, which was really fun. They helped us do some projects and we got to hang out and play games and do fun things. Um, but we also had our first, so 30 degree night was our first freeze. And then the next night it was 18. And then the next two nights, it was like right around there, like right around 20 degrees. And now for our next like nine or 10 days, no freezing temperatures in the forecast. I wonder what that will do for so, like the grass and stuff like that. Cause yeah. I noticed the grass seemed like it was kind of on the decline, but mm -hmm. I wonder if it'll perk back up a little bit. You know, we're supposed to get a lot of moisture yeah. in the next few days. So it might, cause that, that would be my concern. Our highs are going to get close to 60, mm -hmm. just perfect it's like the perfect weather yeah. it kind of extends when i saw those freezing temperatures i thought oh boy i'm gonna have to get out there get all the dah dahlias dug sweet potatoes done um and you know we didn't everything it, happens at once yeah it didn't look like we were gonna have that much time to do it and i thought oh i don't know like sweet potatoes we wait until first frost because they will continue growing all the way up to first frost and larger tubers tend to store a little bit better for me and then dahlias i wait for a killing frost so that the tops are dead the tubers are of course okay unless it gets really cold and if we have consecutive nights of really cold that frost line just like moves down in the soil thankfully they're fine and uh with this forecast now we can just work on like a row at a time <sighs> which that's so nice one interesting thing i did learn this week though you guys uh, is that pegasus begonias we had them in all of our window boxes around the house the one morning that i got 18 degrees when i came outside it wasn't 18 but it was still below freezing and they were all frozen in place and they looked perfect. But as the day warmed up, they started to like, oh, you know, cause Pegasus begonias are annuals. They don't like really cold temperatures. They completely flopped and then they bled like red pools of like a crime scene. It looked like a crime scene all the way around our house. It did not stain. We didn't let it sit for very long. It sat for maybe a day. Yeah. I think the next morning, Paul and Bethany went and cleaned out the window boxes and totally it took some scrubbing. So I don't know if you left that on there, if it would, stain worse or stain it at all i don't know maybe it wouldn't why was it red well the stems are red are they yeah oh, and i so guess i never noticed that i didn't have any idea that they would do that though i did take a picture so we can put that on the screen it's just like a little shot of the begonias looking sad and then the, the pool of red <laughs> below them but you have to like they times, were murdered tame, times that by however many we had all the way around the house oh uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention before we dive into this last week's videos, uh, we have added green stock vertical gardens onto our website. We've got two different styles in two different colors. So we've mm -hmm. got the original five tier, which is what we have. That's why I have the strawberries planted in. Um, we have them in the colors evergreen, which is the ones I have, and then the color stone, which is like a, like a tan color. And then we also have the seven tier leaf. Mm-hmm. Uh, green stock. So anyway, we will link that down below. And we're just kind of going through and trying to like, add the things that we find the most helpful and the most useful and the things that we actually use. I feel like that's one of the best, um, like if you want to do a strawberry tower specific, I mean, you can do a lot of other things yeah. like herbs and there's a lot of stuff you can grow in them. Somebody grew sweet potatoes in them. I really? saw it on their Instagram. You should look up their Instagram. Um, they took the whole layer. I'm sorry, I totally interrupted no, you, but fine. they took the whole layer and dumped it out and there were big sweet potatoes. Wow. So that's an option. Well, just, I mean, the kids loved it for um, strawberries. Yes, they did. Because it's like right at their level. Yep. And, and then ours too. Like you don't, like they can be taking care of the ones at the bottom mm -hmm. and you can be eating the ones at the top. Right. Um, the, one of the nicest things about having them on the website is that we can do like discounts and we can do like giveaways whenever we want. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to ask like permission from mm -hmm. anybody because like we're offering it now. Right. So like you want to give a couple away? Yeah. We, let's do three. Give three away? Yeah. Okay, so we'll give three of the five tier originals away. All you have to do is comment below this video. There. Easy. Boom. Done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. I love it. Uh, we will announce winners in the description of this video. So there are scammers everywhere on the internet. And if you see a somebody that looks like me, because people steal our profile picture all the time, and then they come up with a name that's similar to ours. But if they send you a message and you think you may have one, because we do send messages if you have one, go to this video a week from now, from when it's posted, and just verify that you're one of the three winners. We will post the names in the description of this video. That's the best way to check. You know, it's not that hard. If you just click on the the, like the, pro, um, the name of the yeah. person that messaged you, it will either take you to our page or it won't. Right. And if it doesn't, you know it's a scam. Yeah. If it takes you to our page, it's not a scam. Yeah. So check that and then check the names in the description. Yeah. 
Okay, let's get into the videos from this last week. First one was dividing and transplanting iris and baking apple sausage stuffed butternut squash. Um, so I did exactly that. Those are the two things in that video. Uh, Cindy Henry said, forgot to ask what temperature was the oven set to? Did not see it in the video or the recipe instructions. Did I not even say? Oh, it's in the recipe. But so wasn't me... there a link for it or Here no? Here we go, I've got it. It's 400 degrees right there. There you go. Was it in the link? Yeah, it's in the oh, link. Oh, okay. Yeah. So at least it was, it it was, was somewhere. visible yeah. somewhere. Sometimes so. I've noticed that YouTube has made it harder uh, to find links. Oh, really? Yeah, it's like the description is kind of vague. Like there's, um, you have to click like show more mm -hmm. or expand. I forget what it is, like a little blue, you know, thing. Mm -hmm. So it shows you like a little bit of the description, but then, yeah, I don't like the way that they're doing the description mm -hmm. personally. But Next question is from Holly. Will the irises bloom next year after being transplanted or will they need another year? When I divide and transplant, they tend to bloom the next year. I did that last fall. I moved a bunch of black and yellow ones from the back, the north garden, kind of the pond area, and moved them out to the south garden, and they all bloomed this year. And then I had a couple of them rebloom. I guess there's reblooming iris. These are mm. not reblooming iris, though, because I've had these in the garden for six years, and they only bloom in the spring. Um, but I had a couple of random stems come up this fall, huh. which has been really fun. I can go over there and drinking that scent you know i wonder if um if like all iris is generally not reblooming but you know how like proven winners has their reblooming lilac yeah um I, I wonder if there's like something like some trait within some lilacs or you know whatever plant it is that mm -hmm. kind of like will rebloom but like you need to keep breeding that specific trait so it's like you know you have this iris mm -hmm. and you've got these shoots and so like maybe that specific plant is a little bit of an abnormality, but if so you kept like, breeding that specific one right. and not the rest, and then, I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Like bring, it's kind of like testing a bunch of things in, that are the same. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I not don't know how, it, I don't know how it all works, but like just breeding for the traits that you're yeah, desiring. Yeah, you pull out the one that's doing what you want it to do. And yeah. then you try to perpetuate that one instead yeah. of the other. So yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, Julie said, a question about tagging dahlias. I probably missed something, but it, wouldn't it be easier to tag them when you planted the rhizome? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Except for um, there's nothing to tag. So. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, ideally, you would go along and tag them when everything's small. But you do want to account for, like, stem size. There's some of those stems that are, like, two-inch caliper. I mean, they're massive trunks. So you'd want to make sure to do it really loose, and you might lose some. They might slip off. Um, but definitely there's easier ways of doing it. I mean, just putting a tag in the ground. Next year, I probably won't have kids that will find it fun to pull tags out of the ground and move things around. That's true. Not not trying to throw any shade at my kids, <laughs> but uh, they do. Well, it was like 100% Samantha. Yeah. <laughs> she she did like to like, oh, look, mom, look what I found. Well, she'd bring uh, them to you. She'd be like, look, mom, here yeah, you go. Yeah, here's like, seven tags I pulled out of the ground. Yeah. Good luck yeah. putting them back. Um, so, you know, tagging would be the best. Sometimes, though, you dig it, you label it, you tag it the next year, and it still comes up and blooms like wrong um like something somewhere along the line we got our lines along the way we got our lines crossed and didn't tag it properly so it was really quite nice to do it at a point where i didn't i mean it was very thick in there so I, by the end i was just kind of plowing through didn't care if i broke branches but i could verify the bloom with the you know tag so that i was tagging them properly David said, I love this video with all the different projects. One question about the iris planting. I always read that you should not bury the rhizomes completely instead of just cover it halfway with soil. Since you buried the rhizomes completely, what is the truth? I did not talk about this in the video. I didn't even think about it. I did bury mine quite far because when I water them in, a lot of the soil goes off the top and I find that it helps kind of like root them, not root them, um, nest them in a little bit better. You do want some of the rhizome to be showing. Um, so you don't want them to be buried completely and it's just one of those things like just autopilot for me. I'm sorry, you guys. Sometimes I just forget along the way. I just kind of blow through the project and uh, forget a detail that's quite important. But when we go through with the hose and or rain or whatever, it will knock some of that fluffy soil off. And it just, yeah, everything kind of settles in how it needs to. And I've always had pretty good luck doing it that way. Robin Johnson said, what is the name of the maroon dahlia right behind you at 2940? Uh, I think that one is lights out. Let me just, I can verify, hold on. Yep, that one is called Lights Out. 
it's a it's a beauty i really like that one i found myself cutting that in the cut garden i find myself going toward warm colors a lot do um do most people plant dahlias in rows like you do or do you ever find that people plant them out like in their garden yeah yeah like in the back of a flower bed or something like that i don't know what the ratio is like you know what people normally do but they do have to be planted somewhere where you can stake them Mm. So you'd want to plant them somewhere where you've got that infrastructure in or somewhere where you could put a stake in easily Mm -hmm. um, or that you could get to them easily, you know, to deadhead and things like that. Maybe it's difficult to place them in the garden because they go from zero to a hundred. Like it's kind of like planting sunflowers in your garden, you know, it's like, well, it's going to get six feet tall or more. And that's really hard to define spaces that look good all year round. Right. Like it's better just to do like shrubs and evergreens and something that will fill in the space instead of dahlias, which go away for quite a lot of the year. And they take up, you have to account for so much space. Right. right. Oh, and then how often do you recommend to divide the irises? Oh, probably more often than I do. I don't know if it's like, there's a recommended time frame, but I would say every few years you'd want to get in there and see what's going on and, and divide them. Uh, how to do everything said, have you ever cut yourself pruning? You work so fast. It stresses me out, stresses you out sometimes. Um, I don't think I've, I mean, not that that will help, but I don't, I don't think I've ever cut myself with the pruners, like going in like this. I have stepped on my pruners before with bare feet though (laughs) and cut my foot (laughs) open. Yeah. That was in 2019. I remember that. It does look like you could cut yourself really easily with your pruners. Yeah. Because you, you go pretty fast and furious. I worry more about that electric pruner or the battery operated pruner. Yeah. That one, that one is a little bit scary. I only get that out if I like really, when I did the elderberry and I knew there was going to be a bunch of big cuts, yeah. but not big enough. And it's too small of a space to get the big loppers in there. That's a nice pruner. It is. It is a very nice pruner, but boy, I mean, you could lop something off fast. I mean, if you're doing it manually, at least you could stop halfway. You know, right. you would notice something's going on, but that one just like, boom. Yeah. You got to be careful with you're it. You're done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lita Solis said, would you do this to daylilies too? My daylilies are so tired now and need cleaning, but I thought I'd wait till late winter. Uh, yeah, you could absolutely do that. I mean, Dividing is either like an early fall or probably like an early spring project. Um, so depending on where you are, I mean, you can clean them up and we're going to do a lot of cut back this fall just because I don't want to winter over thrips. Um, and that's how I used to do everything. I used to slick my entire garden up in the fall and I never really had massive bug problems. So it's something to consider. I mean, you see all those things about don't clean up your garden until it's 50 degrees outside. <laughs> if we waited to do that, we would run out of time because it doesn't reach 50 until like consistently 50 out until late in the season. And you know, you are overwintering some bad with good too. So, I mean, consider that. Uh, we're gonna kind of pick and choose what we're cleaning up, but yeah, you could definitely divide and replant dailies. Just make sure to keep them watered. I think that's the biggest thing going into winter. If you have long spells of wind, dry spells, just make sure to splash a little water on anything new. Uh, Becky said about the dahlias and your tagging, do you just know by heart what is the name of each one or do you have to look them up? Occasionally I have to look them up. I've had a lot of the same variety though out there for a lot of years. So there's some I just know and it just comes with the uh, having them for that long. Uh, There are a lot of them I would like to phase out and get new ones. I found, let's see, I, I dug up two rows so far. I have found a little bit of crown gall, so that's taken care of some of them. And thankfully, it's on ones that I don't like Sonic Bloom. I have so many of those. And um, so I'm just tossing clumps. Uh, nothing that I really like has been affected yet, though, hmm. which is nice. Most haven't been affected. But anyway, I kind of want to start with some new ones. And I kind of am considering a different staking method next year. Something more of a box. Really? Instead of a single. Yeah. I don't know. Like more like, um, more like our raspberries, raspberries but, yeah. but smaller. Well, you mentioned in the tour, I think it was that like one more year of T posts. Yeah. And Just then, to see if we like the spacing. Yeah. Cause right now we have roughly four feet between rows and I'm thinking of doing six feet between rows. I think that should be enough, especially if we do a better job of staking them up, mm-hmm. have a different method. Okay. 
Next video was planting five gorgeous evergreens just in time for winter. So you helped me on this video. I uh -huh. had two boxwoods, Julia Janes, that we planted in containers. And then I had a comet, Austrian pine, which is one that stays fairly narrow. That went by the pond. We had an avatar blue spruce went out in the south garden. And then I had a Montgomery blue spruce that went in the south garden. They were on opposite ends of one another. And it was just fun to get out there. We were talking the other day about how we're going into the season where we're going to care a heck of a lot more about evergreens. No. Although I feel like we cared a lot this year. Like we focused on yeah. getting a lot of evergreens and having that Isley load send out. Yeah, I um, I really like Isley stuff. Yeah, they have more specimen, mm -hmm. like harder to find varieties, some neat growing things, and a lot of things that stay smaller. Yeah. Vernon said, "Been watching since your beginning. So inspirational. It was your influence that encouraged our daughter to do a fresh flower stand by her house, and that's been really productive. That's awesome. I have. Um, have you ever considered opening as a wedding venue?" I think we've talked about this a few times maybe. I but. really want to do it. I don't want to do a venue. I don't want to open it up to the public. I want to like hand select who the person is. I want to do it one time. I think it'd be super fun uh, to like, to have one event that you kind of like plan for and get the garden looking good for. Uh, again, not a venue that's open, but just, I don't I, know why. It just sounds like it'd be super fun. I would rather not do a wedding. wedding. I would rather do a tour. I'd rather get the garden ready to have people come through, tour, oh, sure. and then leave. Yeah. Tour, and then well, leave. <laughs> also, if we did a wedding, um, I think that it w you'd probably want to do, like, no children. Because oh, yeah. The just pond. Because, and, yeah, the pond. Yeah. And, I mean, you know how kids are. They just start running around, and they don't care about your boxwood hedging or anything. They're just, like, climbing over, you know, stuff. They're kids, mm -hmm. you know? Like, kids are kids. <laughs> yeah. And you can't... Uh, we sound like, like such fun people, don't well, we? Well, here's the thing is that like we can parent our children, but you can't parent other people's right. kids. And so you just have to make things kid proof when Which there's kids around. Which ours is not. That's for sure. Or, I mean, you could hire like a ton of people to keep, you know, that doesn't make any sense. See, it should, it'd be just better just to get it ready and then have a tour. And that way you could um, have, you could have a lot more people come through too. Are you saying you want to do a tour next year? No, <laughs> I'm just saying I would rather do a tour than a wedding. Okay. For sure. Sure. Yeah. Cause I mean, you, you're, you're, you mean like, uh, like-minded people that yes. enjoy gardens and yes. yeah, sure. Yes, for sure. Because yeah, there's just so many different things to think about with the wedding. Yeah. Like getting ready facility, bathroom facility, cause people are there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you allow alcohol on your Well, grounds, see, here's the thing is kids, it, if yeah. it's a wedding, they pay for all of it. So that's what I mean. Like you hand select someone, you're like, you know, you need to pay for this, this, and this. And all, a lot of that expense, like bathrooms and stuff, you can tell them like, you know, we don't want you bringing in porta potties, bring in like the nice trailer ones that have generators and Do stuff. Do we have anywhere in this? Oh yeah. You can get them out of Boise. Okay. I called around at one time. I don't remember why I was calling around, but you can Probably get them. for the tour. The last one we were going to do that. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Cancel. Yeah. They're kind of spendy. I, I bet they are. Anyway. Yeah. We, we talk about it on occasion. Amy said, do you two ever have disagreements over where to place plants? Does Laura usually win? <laughs> Not, I don't really. We don't disagree. Oh, I do. No, we do. Where? Um, or okay, when, so I like, guess. Where I, and when? I want to plant stuff to block the barn. Like, I really want to. That's kind of a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. Also, do you remember, um, I really wanted evergreens along our back fence in the North Garden. I wanted that for years and years. And the flower beds were like oh, too narrow. two and a half feet wide. Well, or whatever. there was just, for me, I totally would agree with that. Um, for me, it was, there was so much infrastructure that needed to come out. We didn't have a plan for that area, but right. now that there is a solid plan, I'm like, let's go. Let's we, do the evergreens. We still ended up doing it without a plan though. Do you remember? Like we just ended up cutting out grass and putting in the, yeah. it, and here's the deal is that I'm kind of glad that you drug your feet as long as you did, because we didn't know about Nathan. And yeah. so Nathan came, Malad, uh, Malad Tree Farm, and came and put in some really large evergreens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we would have gotten my way, we would have ended up putting in much smaller evergreens. So I'm happy that it ended up waiting. We ended up waiting to think, get bigger ones. I think that's the thing. Like, we don't fight about about no. tree placement. Uh, we have discussions about tree placement. But overall, I would say we don't. We have don't. difference of opinion on 
on yeah, some things. Yeah, and I, like I'm good with the barn thing, but there's other things that are playing into the whole like how that space is going to evolve. I mean, we're the dream stream next year, you mm -hmm. know, off the pond, uh, plus a couple other things. I might have to run right through that area right by the barn. Um, so I just kind of like want to wait. That's another thing. Like I want to wait until we know how it's yeah. exactly going to be used. And then because evergreens and things aren't like shrubs and perennials to me. Shrubs and perennials are like, annuals like we could move them we could pull them we could move them somewhere else mm -hmm. um those are easy but big things like that i want to be a little bit more careful you know yeah because they're harder to move and and such uh liz said at 605 what is the tree cluster in the back of the bed a birch yes that's a royal frost birch and i bought three like 10 gallon i think birch and just dug a great big old hole. I think you have a picture of the three root balls yeah. sitting in that hole, and they've done beautifully. Uh, Frank said, how often do you water the blue spruces when you plant this time of year? Well, you watered them in that day, and we haven't mm -hmm. watered them since. We're supposed to get rain, so probably not again. Yeah, I wonder if I should go give them like a little splash of water. I wouldn't Because the system's been off. We're going to move a few things today. We've got some plants that need to be just shifted around a bit. And we'll probably hit them today, I guess, because we'll have to get the hose out for that. Mm -hmm. That'd be perfect. Uh, Garden Therapy said, question, you have so many beautiful roses. If you could pick just one as your very favorite, which one would it be? <sighs> I don't know. Okay, so the one that we've talked about a lot is the all dressed up. Mm -hmm. In terms of growth habit, uh, leaf health, uh, bloom, like the amount of blooms, that one's a beautiful. But we've got some really pretty ones out there. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can pick one. I think there's so many beautiful ones. I do prefer though full cup, like like English or heirloom roses. I do prefer those over others, but there are some really pretty hybrid teas out in the rose garden. I don't know. That's, yeah. that's such a tough one to answer. Uh, Auntie said, do you still have hydrangeas in containers? If so, what do you do with them in the winter? I do have those macrophylla, the enchantress blue or something like that. Uh, I've got two that I planted in concrete containers by the back kitchen area. I might just leave those there because they're pretty protected and we'll just make sure to keep some water on them. Uh, the other ones, I had them tucked behind the boxwood hedge that kind of hug the corner of the back of our house and I'd never planted those. They just stayed in their con like nursery containers. So those we've tucked in behind the greenhouse. Anything that we have left like perennial and shrub wise that do need a cold period, they just get all tucked in back there. That way they're easy to water. They're close to a frost free hose water source. Um, so. Anyway, that's what we do. I thought about putting all of those as well as Japanese maples in the high tunnel so that they were protected a little bit, but it's not really the cold, I don't think. It's just making sure to keep them watered, mm -hmm. and there is not a water source, a frost-free close to that area. It would be a total pain to water those out there, so we yeah. moved everything this way. Uh, Melody said, Aaron is a little feisty today, <laughs> every day. Is he ready to put the gardens to bed for winter and rest? I was simply making a point that the pussy willow was a little bit... Is that the only time you were feisty that day? upon the path. Um, I think so. Maybe. Was I feisty about anything else? No, I don't know. Probably. Pretty sure he was. Margaret said, I was wondering if all the bugs you released have kept all the nasties at bay. They did a really good job. They really did. By the end of the season, I was seeing, like, I was checking dahlias. At the beginning of the season, I could take a dahlia flower and kind of tap it in my hand, and there'd be thrips all over my hand. By the end, there was, like, zero on most dahlias. Uh, I found a few, where did I find a few? A few out of my straw flowers. Hmm. Found a few in there, but very little. So if we uh, do a good garden cleanup this fall and then release the predatory mites again this next spring, but earlier in the year, so more as a preventative than as a, uh, you know. I'll bet you're gonna have to do it multiple times. Not the whole garden, but just anywhere that you notice. Like yeah. if you just stay on Roses, it. Roses, dahlias, yeah. just Anything cut Anything you see, right? mites or thrips. Yeah just uh, do spot i think i might try multiples though like different types yeah they have so many different beneficials and when i was talking with Bo from ag idaho he just said there's a lot of things that we can try some really cool stuff so i'm down like mm -hmm. i would love to try it even if we're off another year for the cut flower garden it honestly was super relaxing and i enjoyed my year so i this year for the first time I'm a little torn on putting the garden to bed. Usually I am ready. I'm ready to move on to like a little bit more of a restful time of mm -hmm. year um, and kind of a planning time of year. But this year I just, one, I'm gonna miss being able to take the kids outside for hours every single evening. Yeah. That's what we do every evening. So it gets a little bit more dicey that way because uh, it just gets too cold. But 
also just have enjoyed, have enjoyed the space so much this year just because it's so relaxed. Anyway, that was not the point of the question. Yes, I think the beneficials really did help. Um, Callie said, good morning from Nebraska. I planted dahlias from seed. I put the seedlings out in the flower bed. Do I need to dig it up? Yes. Would it form rhizomes or whatever they are called? Yes. It's amazing. Dahlias from seed, it's so easy. It's one of the easiest things to start from a seed. You do have to watch them for mites um, in, in closed spaces, especially. That's just something that I dealt with uh, the first time I ever tried them. So as long as you're keeping your eye on that, they grow big and beautiful um, and they're ready to be set out. Like they're beautiful already when you're ready to set them out um, once it's warm enough outside, but they do create tubers that first year. They're smaller, but they, they do. I had one clump that had like five or six tubers on it just from one seed. Okay, next video was the end of October garden tour. Uh, we just figured like it was now or never for the last part of- It was now or never. Yeah, I think that night maybe we got yeah. a frost. It got freezing right in the middle of the tour. We had to go in and put shoes and coats and stuff on and it started to rain. I had to put shoes on. I had to put shoes on, yeah. I already well, had shoes on. You did. <laughs> I had sandals on, that's what I mean. Yeah. I had to put real shoes on, which like right now I have sandals on. Um, I'll have to go put real shoes on to go do my gardening. I wouldn't if we didn't film videos, but we do. And so I wear semi, semi proper footwear while we're out there. Sensible heels. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I think everything looked pretty good still for that tour. I think the dahlias were still looking good. They hadn't been frozen yet. Yeah. So it was, it was fun. Uh, Lynn said, I noticed that your purple coneflowers were still blooming beautifully. Mine went to seed many weeks ago. What's your secret to keeping them going for so long? Well, some of mine aren't, but the Echinacea purpurea just tends to go for the whole season. I think I want to start a whole bunch of those and just do some big drifts out in the garden, like big ones, because of how productive they are and they're just like pollinator attractors and they're just great for the garden. Sandy said, I had an opportunity to buy a bald cypress, but decided against it when I did research and discovered that they can possibly grow knees. Will the bald cypress in your garden grow them? Is there a way to control the knee growth or a species that doesn't grow knees? Aaron, you probably could speak I to that. I looked it up. Um, it sounded like they wouldn't grow knees if, um, if, it w if it's really wet then they might grow knees, mm -hmm. but where we are and we do such targeted watering, I don't think that they will, but they could, I don't have any experience with them, except that our community college has some that are way more mature than mm -hmm. the ones that we have. Like, what do you think? 10, 15 year oh, old least. trees yeah. mm -hmm. and they have no knees. Right. So in our area and even in that area, they're planted around grass. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I don't think that at least the variety that we got which is the same as what our community college has, mm -hmm. didn't grow knees. Right. There could be other varieties that do. Yeah. Anne said, the rose garden looks fabulous. What is your schedule of fertilization and spraying for insects on those rose plants? Um, well, we fertilized them at planting. They were not fertilized again and we never sprayed them. <laughs> so pretty much no schedule. I think next year we'll have something more permanent or yeah. more definite. The Espoma bag says to do it once a month, which to me, we have such a long season that, that seems crazy to me, but I would kind of next year like to try it. You know how much those roses grew this year from like sticks? Yeah, but like, um, I wonder if the rose tone is, will make them more productive with blooms. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting. We probably should have made like significantly larger walking rows. Like we could just about take out every other row. That'd be a little bit too much, but like you were off big time. <laughs> There's five feet between each row. That's not, <laughs> <laughs> that means that all of them will touch basically. No, because all of them are like three to four footers. So yeah. they grow and one and in and our half. area, we know that in the full sun, everything gets larger than the tag. Maybe I'll get some cages for them to grow in that keeps them all more upright. Yeah, we either need to do that or we need to like just redo the whole area and get rid of a row or two rows. There are some varieties I want to call out already um, that just aren't, they're not like quite the color I want or like the blooms come out in too big of sprays and then they'll mm -hmm. have like one bloom that's perfect and then the rest are still waiting to bloom. And so by the time you get a larger bloom on there, you've got some spent flowers. So not perfect for a cutting space, good for a flower bed. So there's, there's some that I want to move out. We could... We could play around with it a little bit, maybe. <laughs> uh, Sue Parr said, 
Great garden tour, so much color for the end of October. Not sure if you've gotten this comment before, but what happened to the blueberries? If you could see, I could see the tubs in the background out by the garden shed, but could not determine if the blueberries were still growing them. They are. I've tried to plant blueberries so many times with no luck, zone five. Um, yeah, they produced, mm -hmm. they produced quite a lot of blueberries. I don't know why I didn't really go over cool. there yeah. a whole bunch this year. Years, you know, every year's a little bit different. They There's, weren't like... They're I about mean, like they are every year. It wasn't like a showstopper. No, but there were a couple of times where they were pretty thick. Yeah. Yeah. Samantha loves them. Have we been putting soil acidifier in there? Have I been putting soil acidifier? Oh, no. <laughs> I know I didn't. I didn't either. I think I did once. Yeah. But it probably needs multiple, like once a month. Yeah, probably so. Application is my yeah. guess. Although it was good knowing that um, our water is 7.5 instead yeah. of like... Eight or yeah. nine. I mean, I don't, it wouldn't be over eight. That'd There's be places in Vail crazy. that are. Yeah, but that'd be crazy. It, yeah. Uh, Lynette Street said, I have yet to see you plant any heliotrope. Fragrant Delight is one of my favorites, and I plant it all over my garden. Is it hardy in your zone? It is not. Um, and it's more of a cool season flower for us anyway. I think Proven Winners has a new-ish new one. Let me find the name of it. Um, that's supposed to go longer, but usually... I don't plant it because it's just kind of a spring flower for us. And uh, it, Augusta Lavender. And it's not like, it does smell good, but, but it's not like a super big, you know, like showstopper plant. What's the zone? Is it just like this one? The six Augusta, or seven? Augusta Lavender is, I don't even have a zone on it. It just says annual. Oh. Oh, no, it does. Eight to 11 mm. on this one. But it says planting to frost bloom on this one, long blooming heat tolerance, which not all are. So lavender heliotrope, I think I tried it. Where did I plant that? I'll have to try it again because it is it is a wonderfully fragrant plant. Miss Thang said, your fall garden is still so gorgeous. Question, how and what do you use to bait for earwigs? They are the bane of my existence from mid-April to late autumn here in Ontario, Canada. Honestly, they do so much damage. Um, we use the, the bu bug and... Slug killer? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. I can never remember the name of that. It's a bonide bug and, well, yeah, bug and slug killer. You're right. I, for some reason, that just didn't sound right to me. Um, so we bait with that. Seems to work really nicely. It's like a granule. We should add that to the store. Allie said, do you ever save your dahlia seeds to see what beauty they create? It would be fun if you did. Then you could name one of the vari new varieties, Samantha, and one Benjamin or dude. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. I'm saving seeds this year to plant in the spring. I love saving seeds. I find it so gratifying. Love everything you do. Thank you for always sharing with us. That's really sweet. Um, I haven't saved dahlia seeds. I wonder if I still could out there. Just grab a few and see what happens. Would you want to? Yeah. Yeah. I think I would want you to. Then. Yeah, and just see what, what comes of it. Um, other, another one from Ali said, does Aaron have a favorite rose in the rose garden? Yeah, what's your favorite? No, I think... Um... I think all dressed up, not in the rose garden. Um, I mean, there's a lot that I like. There's mm -hmm. none that really stand out. But man, the all dressed up, it's the leaves. It's not the, uh, the blooms are great. Yeah. It's the leaves, like, like the dark green leaves. Yeah, they're so glossy. Yeah, there just aren't that many varieties. So many of our leaves, uh, other varieties of leaves are kind of yellowy and... Mm -hmm. Like dull. Yeah, they dull yeah. out. And But this one's like rich. Yeah, like how do we get a hold of that? Like... Like more of it. Yeah. Del Rey said, when do you move in your hose links? Do you have to drain them first? Well, ideally they'd be moved in by now. Yeah. But they're not. They're, a lot of them are still out in the garden. Um, yeah. We just drain them out. A lot of time you can just put an air compressor in there and just shoot the water out. And then there's a storage rack up in the loft of our barn. I've got a photo do of you? that. It's kind of hilarious because there's just like 20 or 30 <laughs> hose links just all <laughs> in a pile. Yeah, they're easy to move around. We do keep out the one in the greenhouse because now that the greenhouse has some heat, um, we can hook a like a shorter hose from the frost free outside. If I could go back, I would put a frost free in that greenhouse. You know, we said we were going to do that this year. We need trench to, over. Yeah. I just need to ask Pedro to put that on his list yes. of things to do. But you at have this to hand point, dig it because there's a gas line now that goes yeah. through the area. There's which, a ton of stuff that goes through there. Electric it, and yeah. gas. So you have to go four feet down and you have to do it by hand. Thankfully, it's only like 10, I mean, yeah. still, it's a lot, but it's like, what, 10, 15 feet from the yeah. barn to the greenhouse. 
Um, but oh, to have a frost free in there where I could just turn the hose on whenever mm -hmm. we need to. And I didn't have to sling a hose out because then I have to have the door propped open of the greenhouse. And even that little sliver, I hate having cold air come in when we're paying to have the hot air stay in, you know? Right. <sighs> so it's just one of those things, you know, hindsight. There's not a lot that I look back on and think I wish we would have done it differently. Mm -hmm. Because even like the the evergreen border we could have done on the it, like by the cut flower garden, mm -hmm. I don't think that we could have fit all the things that we wanted to fit had we done that. So there's a part of me that's like, oh, it would have been nice to have that, but I think what we have there is awesome. Sure. I don't know. And there's part of it that I just don't want to think too hard about it because I just want to be content with what we've done, yeah. you know? All right, next video, planting bulbs around the pond and in, and in the orchard. That is the one that we had Gabe and Katie's help with. And Aaron, you were able to be out last year when we did bulb planting. It was Gabe, Katie, and I. So there's three of us still. But having you there, because you, you were watching the kids last year. Yeah. Because Samantha was a lot younger. Um, having your, like an extra set of hands, all four of us out there, it went so much quicker. Aaron and I were on augers. And, and Benjamin. And Benjamin. <laughs> um, Gabe's always on fertilizer duty, and Katie always prefers to plant the bulbs. So... It worked out perfectly and I'm so excited about it. There's some daffodils, anemones, and snowdrops around the pond, which I chose those because, and that specific variety of da uh, daffodil, because they look a little bit more natural mm -hmm. than um, some of the other ones, like no tulips around that area, nothing that's like informal. Tulips aren't formal, but you know what I mean. They're like more colorful. They can be formal. I kind of wanted like more like natural color, something that you would find out. The only other thing I could think to add to that space would be some um, winter aconite. Are we gonna speaking of formal? Yeah. And tulips. Are we gonna have the tulips come back again in the parterre garden? No, those are all gone. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, because yeah, Christy we, took all of those. Because right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because I'm gonna do something different in the spring. Yeah. I don't really want to be bound in those, those specific areas. I don't want to be bound to the same thing every year. Well, Plus, I'm waiting for the foliage to die back. Oh. Yeah. Well, there's that. And then also when you get ready to plant your summer stuff, then you're inevitably wrecking some mm -hmm. bulbs. So every year it'd be like a little bit more of a meager display in spaces that you continually plant differently. I like the way you have it now. Oh, me too. The cabbage. Yeah. Let's figure out something like that for next year. Super yeah. bells. Like, let's do all super bells in there. They all stay, like, really tidy and yeah. compact. Well, the boxwoods will start to keep them more compact. Yeah. Like, once the boxwoods form that hedge, then the, um, whatever you plant in there won't be able to get right. out. Right. Super tunius this year were, like, like, coming over the boxwoods yeah. and pouring out onto the walkways. Well, we talked about doing uh, begonias in there, the surefire. Oh, that's right. Let's do that. We that's could a... do the white in there or whatever color Or the you rose. Wanted. Either yeah. one. Oh, they're so pretty. Okay, so anyway, Chrissy said, uh, how do you know where to dig holes in the orchard? I don't. I just randomly dig holes. I think in that whole space, I did you run into bulbs? Yeah, a couple. Oh, oh a couple. Cause I Not say, a ton. I probably ran into uh, two, maybe, maybe three. And we've got thousands of bulbs I ran in into there. less than five. So it, it really worked out quite nicely. Um, yeah. I don't know how else to... How else to I think tell. you just know that you're going to hit some yeah, and it's just it just is of, what it is. If you don't do like the right order of things, like get your whole flower bed or whatever your area is established and planted and then go in and plant bulbs around things, it's just really hard. Yeah. It'll be interesting in that spot to see what happens. In the orchard? In the orchard. Yeah. yeah. Like what, what comes up because there's the stuff that was there, which I'm assuming will probably sort of naturalize a little bit i hope but it's got a lot of thicker of a canopy to come through now yeah the it grass does. is like whoo, so i mean we'll see what yeah happens um so maya said could you please throw some light on water requirements after planting flower bulbs and how to protect them from squirrels and other pests that eat flower bulbs uh, i can't really speak to the squirrel thing we do have squirrels but they haven't really wrecked a whole bunch of our bulbs i know a lot of people will put like a hardware cloth over the top um, so they can't dig mm -hmm. through or like a chicken wire and then you can remove it once they start to grow up. Um, I, people have tried repellents, but say that it really doesn't do a whole lot for squirrels. Uh, as far as watering, definitely a good idea to water them in, kind of settle them in. Um, we did not because we were kind of in a hurry and we were just going through it. And now that we're getting rain, I'm not super worried about it. So just look at the forecast. They can sit dry in the ground for a couple weeks until you get rain. Because they're already if they need dry. To. Yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't, don't stress too much about it. Uh, Betty said, why do I think anemone bulbs are supposed to be soaked for an hour or so? Uh, normally they are. If you're planting them in the spring, like we do our anemones out in the cut flower garden, I do soak them. That gives you a jump on the growing. There's a couple different things you can do. You can pre-soak them and plant them straight out if the weather is good. This is in the spring. Um, or you can pre-soak them and then uh, sprout them in a warmer location and then plant them out uh, after that. And that gives you even more of a jump. But if you're planting them in the fall, there's no need to do that because they're going to sit in the ground and they're going to soak up moisture and plump up like on a normal schedule. YouTube channel said, do you ever spread grass seed over the holes when planting bulbs and grass or is it too cold for germination? We don't, our grass tends to fill in pretty nicely. Yeah. Without a bunch of extra help. That is the RTF. Um, so I don't, um, the RTF, does that like, does right that zone. fill in? Yeah. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Cause it's, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And honestly, like we'll see what happens with the bulbs this year. Uh, and we may like shift focus and start planting bulbs somewhere else and not worry so much about the orchard because that's taken on a little bit of a, a life of its own and that's how things happen. Uh, I was initially envisioning more of a wild kind of meadow with flowers and things, but that might not be a good fit for an orchard because it's hard to navigate. It's hard to walk around in that. We have to water from overhead and so it would be wet all the time mm -hmm. and laying down all the time because of the moisture and you know the fruit falls in there and it just creates a mess. It was nice that you kept it mowed a little bit higher than the rest of the grass. So there was some distinction, but it was easy to walk around in. Basically mowed it like every other week at the at the tallest setting yeah. that you can mow. Mm -hmm. And I could yeah, if you let it go more than two weeks, mm -hmm. it becomes like a real bear to mow. Yeah. So Dawn said, so I'm curious just exactly how long did it take actual time to plant all those bulbs? Um, we didn't start till like afternoon. Yeah. It was maybe like two to three hours for everything. Yeah, it was an afternoon project. An afternoon project. And we, you know, it takes a lot longer because we have to stop and move cameras and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it would have taken a lot less had we... We got done around like four o'clock too. Yeah, and we started. So maybe, no more than four hours. I think we started closer to like twelve thirty one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it wasn't three too hours. long. Three hours. Wow. Yeah. What were Gabe and Katie's reactions to being able to see actually see in person all the changes from last year when they were visiting? Oh, they're always super encouraging, and um, yeah, they've been following our projects for a while, so they know like where we started and how far it's coming and. Um, they're just really nice people to be around. It's really fun and they love to garden. They've got a beautiful garden. We featured it in one of our, like the side gardens mm -hmm. um, video. Maybe we can find a little picture of uh, what Katie sent us because it's ugh, beautiful. And they get to garden in C the Seattle area. So it's a little bit different, a lot of it different than growing things here. Um, anyway, it's just fun. Mary said, do these augers only fit on DeWalt drills? No, they fit any drill, but you just want to make sure not right any drill yeah is that sure. kind of a blanket statement yeah you just well, want not any drill any brand of drill any brand that's of powerful drill. enough right yeah that's the thing you want to make sure it's it is powerful enough if you have something that's like a are there 16 i don't know all the volt ranges yeah, well but. yeah everybody has their own little voltage but um if you have like if you have what looks like a home use drill you know like something that you would use for tiny little screws mm -hmm. that's not going to be good enough needs to be 18 or 20 volt. yeah like 18 or 20 mm -hmm. volt or more depending on your soil too ours is pretty easy yeah that's the other thing if you've got um if you've got grout like people people say oh yeah, that doesn't work in clay and you know rocks and stuff like that but i know people that that use it it has to do with the drill it has mm -hmm. to do with getting your settings right and having the correct drill if you have a powerful enough drill um, and those the power like you don't really talk about it a lot but those power planter augers are like so much more material than anything else that you get. Like, you know, what your parents have had at the garden center in the years past, they, yeah, they carry they power, power planter, planter now. now. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I'm talking in the past, oh, they had I've these like so many flimsy, yeah. they would just break immediately. The power planter ones, especially the heavy duty versions, which the Laura edition is, mm -hmm. it's a heavy duty one. Um, you can get through so much if you have a powerful enough drill, it is kind of expensive to have mm -hmm. a, a bigger drill, but it, that's what makes all the difference. And I kind of cringe every time I read a comment of somebody saying it doesn't work. Cause I'm like, you're doing something wrong. Well, <laughs> you, you just, you just haven't bought the right tool. Yeah. You haven't bought a, you know, a big enough drill. Mm -hmm. 
And if you did, and I, you also need to be strong enough to run it. So, and there's, you know, it's hard. Like Aaron comes out and does some of the big holes in the areas. I know that there's hard pan because I could stand there forever and try and try. Mm -hmm. And I just cannot get enough weight down on it. Like I just can't rip through it sometimes. Yeah. Um, so you'll come out and it just needs a little bit of extra oomph to sure. get it, to get on the big ones anyway, yeah. because those augers are pretty, they're pretty heavy. Um, I'm thankful though, that the drill now isn't the stud and joist drill. Yeah. I mean, you can still use that one, but that's such a beast. I probably wouldn't haul that one around at this point. I've been looking around for other options uh, instead of the DeWalt one, the 60 volt. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they call it the mud and cement, cement mixer mm -hmm. drill. And um, I just can't really find anything. Like it feels like DeWalt kind of has cornered the market because it's such a niche product yeah. that mm -hmm. like not that many people need that powerful of a drill mm -hmm. in a compact size. Right. But I, yeah, it'd be nice if somebody out there made a cheaper option mm -hmm. but for landscapers i mean i know it's a game changer for landscapers yeah if you're is. doing it if you're doing it professionally like mm -hmm. if you're not using power planter augers what are you doing with your life <laughs> we question this <laughs> Last video was harvesting sweet potatoes and pulling zinnias. So that was another one where I had Gabe and Katie's help. It was so nice. We got all the sweet potatoes dug. They're sitting on the floor in here right next to us, uh, curing, drying, and sweetening up. Um, and then we went out and pulled all of the spent zinnias in the flower garden. We've got quite a lot more clean out to do in that space, which we'll probably tackle here soon. Uh, but it was a nice, it was a nice day and it got warm that day. First question from Helen, what will you do with the status once you cut them? Usually I bundle them and dry them and then we work them into projects here and there. Uh, T.E. McCall said gopher holes made this an exciting video. <laughs> LOL. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Not for me. I found that. I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. I feel like we were getting on top of the gopher problem. And then in the orchard, there's a whole bunch of runs right behind the shed. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to go out there and kind of get those taken care of. Um, and I'm just seeing some mounds crop up here and there. So they're moving back in because there's yeah. less activity around us right now. I don't know. Yeah. Usually activity like gets them moved out. Um, anyway, they're coming back. Tammy said, did you start the Crispedia from seed? I love that flower. Yes, I did. They're very easy to start from seed. Uh, they are one that attracts aphids in their seedling form in the greenhouse. It's something I've dealt with before. So something to keep your eyes out for, but definitely easy to start. Beth said, what are the hoops where the zinnias were? Um, are they better support the netting or the T-posts and strings or wire? They're super hoops from Gardener Supply. I love them because they're so mobile, um, but there was nothing about them that was holding the zinnias up. I just planted mine thick. They supported themselves. Plus, we've had a very mild summer fall with very little wind, so they didn't have to put up with like 70 mile an hour gusts like yeah. we've had in the past. So yeah, that was helpful. that tempest thing, and I want, I mean, like, I don't want, you know, a, a storm, storm to come through, yeah. but I want to test it to see what we get. And we've just had kind of nothing. Right. Uh, Janet said, how do you get rid of gophers? Trapping mostly. One of our neighbors did a trap line. Mm -hmm. When we very first were uh, developing the South Garden, there were just gophers everywhere. Um, and he came over, he grew up farming. So he came over and like manned the trap line and just took care of it every single day. And it was like a thing that he did, which was awesome. Um, so that's how we handle it. Don said, nice harvest video, great friends and helper Benjamin. A couple of people mentioned an extra video. I don't see it. What was the title? Uh, so it's not an extra video. It's just that YouTube came out with a new feature where, um, I can really easily upload the video to where it's available to members, uh, which are like people who support the channel on YouTube. So they get it right when I upload it and then everybody else will get it at the normal time. So basically nothing has changed and it wasn't an extra video. It was just that members get to see it early. Mm -hmm. Cause like I always upload the video, the, the usually like evening before and get it scheduled for the next morning. And it goes up 5 AM our time, like 7 AM Eastern. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that's what that was. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. Uh, Cheryl said, have you planted any more wheat? No, I have not. And I probably will not get to it this fall. Usually I'd have it in the ground a little bit earlier than now. It just didn't work out. Um, we need to retool some of the areas out in the cut flower garden, which is I think where I want to 
like really focus most of our stuff in that space next year and do less out on the new property, maybe just vine crops out there. Who knows? I mean, everything changes once you, you know, you have some time to sit inside for a while and then you want to do all the things. You get all this pent up energy and you want to plant everything everywhere. Um, but I just, I didn't want to lock myself in on wheat planting because I wanted to make sure we could ex uh, move our rows around mm -hmm. uh, a little bit because we need to work on spacing. And in the very beginning, we did the spacing the way we did because I wanted to fit as much as we could in that space and now I'm like oh, there's this is not necessary let's get some air in this space let's like spread things out I do not need 35 tomato plants yeah you know I don't need to plant a thousand pounds of potatoes not plant I don't need to yield a thousand pounds of potatoes um, or 1500 onions <laughs> or whatever it's crazy amount um it's fun to give them away, but it's not a net. I don't need to grow that many mm -hmm. things, you know? So let's figure out the but space. But you kind of do need walking space. Yeah, that's a necessary <laughs> thing. And that's something we're lacking out there. Yeah. So something we need to address. It was a fun project though. That was all brand new. And I felt like it was such a success. Yeah. Um, I did order a, a 25 pound bag of hard red wheat berries so that I could grind those and see how I liked to use that flower. And that way I can get a little bit more experience under my belt knowing what variety to plant, like how I use the flower without having to actually plant it and go through the whole process, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Stacy said, we got our first snowfall yesterday. I, no I noticed that mm -hmm. a lot of you guys have. Um, did Gabe and Katie used to live in your area? Is that how you know them? I think they're just the nicest of friends to travel and come and help you and in your garden. They are. Uh, we met them through this whole YouTube thing. We met them early on at yeah. the Seattle Flower Show. Yeah. And they have been here multiple times for multiple events. They come and help out with a lot of things. And it's just, I'm thankful for them. It's so nice. They came to the, I forgot about this, but they came to that, uh, the groupie event. Yes. I, I called it a groupie event because it was it was kind of organized the by Garden the, groupies. Yeah, yeah. the Garden Answer Groupie Facebook page. Yeah, uh, Lloyd Bent said, when you clear a bed, especially from the cut flower garden, do you remove the roots and all or just cut off at ground level? We remove the roots and all for the most part. There are some things like the corn and sunflower. Well, we do end up, we end up removing all the roots. A lot of times we cut stuff off at ground level and wait until it's easier to dig. Like the, the roots of corn and sunflowers can be kind of hard to get out of the ground if it's like too dry or too wet. You, know, you kind of wait till the ideal moment. Also, if you leave them all winter, they do kind of break down and sometimes they just pull right out of the ground. So kind of wait for ideal time to pull some of them. And that is it, you guys, for today's recap video. We got to get outside and enjoy the sunshine and the weather. I mean, okay, let me just, because for my own, I haven't looked at it today. No freezing, zero freezing for the next 10 days. The lows like are 36, 37, 40, highs 58, 57, 51. It's gonna be really nice. That's my like perfect time. I love the 50s. We can do more, we should make a trip to Jaker and get some evergreens because we, we could should. still plant some this fall. Yeah, we could. What time is it? <laughs> can we do that today? Would I rather do that than dig up a bunch of plants? Maybe. <laughs> Anyway, hope you guys are all having a great start to your week. Thank you so much for watching this video and we will see you in the next one.